Hey everybody, it's Ross and as I'm studying the Word because we have a lot of time on our hands with Corona. It's a terrible thing. At this time, I think 20,000 people have died so far. So I'm praying about lots of different things. My prayer list is about gets longer and longer. But as I have time on my hands, being a single guy by himself, I'm able to study the Word. That is a silver lining or a blessing, as you would call it. And as I was out this time of the year, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we tend to go to those chapters in the Bible, don't we? Just around December, we go the virgin birth. Uh, I, call, I call what many people call Easter, Resurrection Sunday or Resurrection Weekend. That's for another time. The word Easter has another time and that's for another teaching. Happy Resurrection Day. That's what we should be celebrating. And so as I read parts of Scripture, and, and all the Gospels have the, the passages of Scripture, the death of Christ, the beginning of His walk to the cross, uh, the, 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 crucifixion, the, cru, uh, the crucifixion itself, the, the buried in an empty tomb, a tomb that never been used. We know most of the parts of the story. And I was coming to Luke 23, reading what Luke's account, Luke was a detailed doctor. And so he was a little more detailed than some of the others because he's a doctor. Doctors are very detailed, aren't they? And I came across a passage, and it's just too much to, to, to read. I mean, you could study this for, for months and years. But I came to a, a part of scripture that really hit my heart uh, in Luke chapter 22 or 23 and it was it was part I've got it marked out in my Bible and uh, it was when Simon bears the cross of Christ and that starts at verse 26 and it just popped out there were some red letters in there so I knew obviously Christ was speaking uh, you may use a red letter you may not but I like it because I know that Christ is saying something all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for, for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Man, I have some dirty glasses. What a beautiful day, too. Oh, by the way, resist the temptation of going out thinking that the coronavirus epidemic is getting better. It may be getting better, but just hold on some. Be patient. Pray for one of the fruit of the Spirit patience nine fruit of spirit of the spirit nine fruit of the spirit not fruits they're all gathered one tree so pray for them all but patience is something i'm paying, praying for for sure but listen to what it says in 26 in my big my, my pocket bible don't you love my pocket bible it says when they led him away, they seized the man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Jesus had been beaten so badly, and the cross may have weighed over 100 pounds, uh, he was exhausted. So they just pulled Simon from the crowd. Simon helped him bear the cross. We, lots of scholars think that that's something that happened many, many times. Remember, over... 20 or 30,000 people died the way of crucifixion. Crucifixion was a, a, a common way to, to kill a criminal in, in Roman times. So he, so he gathered the, the cross of Jesus. And he followed him. And following him was a large crowd of the people and the women who were mourning and lamenting him. So they were, they were in, in that culture, lots of times in, in, in these types of situations and funerals, they would actually have professional lamenters, wailers, people that would cry for funerals. It was, it was a cultural thing at that time. So there was a lot, and it, just, it mentions women here, and this is unusual because in Hebrew culture, especially in the Bible, women are not mentioned that much they don't have the status in that time of the writings as they do today of course that's why you don't you, you hear brothers dear brothers you don't hear dear brothers and sisters now new translations will have have both 
But and following him was a large crowd of people in verse 28. But Jesus turning to them said, this, this is a, the passage that really str struck me. And I wanted to know, what's he talking about? What is Jesus saying here? He's on his way to the cross to suffer the pain and suffering of sin, to pay the penalty for sin. God provided his sacrifice, his own sacrifice, his own son. He lived a perfect life that you and I could not live. That's why he could pay for my sin and yours. How many times have you sinned before in your life since you've been born? How many times have you lied? A thousand? More than that? How many times have you stolen? How many times have you used God's name as a four-letter curse word to express disgust? That's what sin is. If you want to know what sin is, go to James. James says, sin is transgression against the law. That's why we need to, when we witness to people, use sin to people that are non-believers so they know exactly what sin is and exactly why Jesus died on the cross. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is the eternal life through Jesus Christ. A person that thinks he's a good person doesn't understand the significance of what sin is. So explain why Jesus went to the cross. I always say, make Jesus make sense. Don't use big fancy words to unregenerate people you're witnessing to. It makes no difference to them. Now if you say, hey, you're a good person, you're going to heaven because you're a good person, well, how many times have you lied? Ask questions. Let, let their own conscience that God gave them and the law that's written on every man's heart, whether they believe in God or not, be your ally in your witnessing. I used to witness like a car salesman. Get a lot of conv uh, conversions. Now, they just saying, yeah, praying after me, dear Jesus. They said a prayer after me, dear Jesus. Now, where is that in the Bible? Let's be biblical Christians. I try to be. But Jesus turning to them, they said, Daughters, he's talking to the women that are weeping. Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. Well, it was a sad time. He was going to the cross. He was been beaten. Isaiah said he was beaten unrecognizably. If you go to Isaiah 53, some people have pictures of Jesus all over their house. And that's all right. Whatever, whatever is making you feel better. But... There was no identified, identified painting of Christ. There was people that painted back then. There's plenty of paintings. But he was an average Jewish looking man. That's what Isaiah 53. Now he was beat unrecognizably. That, that's very disturbing to me. That would be like me coming to your house and I op you open the door and you go, can I help you? And it's me. But I was beaten so bad and brutally beaten so bad that you wouldn't recognize it was me. He was beaten that bad. Read Isaiah 53. Get your material from Scripture. Get your material from Scripture. And then the stuff you don't understand, and like me, you go study it out to show yourself approved. He says, Jesus says, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. Well, I would say, well... You're going to the cross. You're going to die. You've been beaten. But he says, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. What is he saying? Jesus, being God in the flesh, lived without sin, performed signs, miracles, and wonders. He knew why he was going to the cross. And in fact, the Bible says, before the foundations of the world, the Lamb of God was slain for our sins. It wasn't by like, oh, God just decided to do it because men was so sinful. God in his heart knew from the beginning of time before eternity passed. And Jesus knew that too, being God. There's some things in his flesh that, that God kept from him because he was 100% man. So some things were kept from Christ and some were not. 100% man, 100% God. He never stopped being God to become man. Remember that. The God man, right? If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, then you're not a Christian. Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Why? You know, I always want to say why. When I read a statement like that in the Bible, it usually prompts a question. Why? Why? 
Why should we weep for our, your children? Let's see what he says. I love scripture because it usually answers itself when it provokes a question. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breast that never nursed. 30. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. That's out of Hosea 10.8. And the other verse in 29 about being bearing, blessed are the bearing and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. That's out of Matthew 24, 19. That's where Jesus makes the end time prophecy. Read Matthew 24, fascinating. And he closes, his, there's so much more to say, but he says, for if they do these things, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Mm, it could be a little hard to understand. What did he mean by that? For if they do these things, do what things? The things he, he, he read, read, we read, for, for behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Well, in that culture, you were cursed or they thought you were cursed if you didn't have children. He looks like he's contradicting himself. Because people that had children or didn't have children were looked down upon in this particular culture at this particular time. For if they do these things when the tree is green, when it's all good, the, the tree is good, what will happen when it is dry? Question mark. Don't you love questions from Jesus? When I witness to people, I don't preach to them. I love to preach. As you would know, go to sermonaudio.com. I got sermons all, all over the place. And you can get it on your cell phone. They're all over. They go all over the world. Some people hear sermons that don't even have electricity. They have solar panels on their houses. Can you believe that? Anyway, sermonaudio.com. If you're a minister and don't have your sermons online, that would be a good investment for you. So what's he saying to them? So I'm doing some studying. The women behind Christ at the back of him and him knowing who they were and, and what they were doing turns himself to them and address them in the manner. You know, he says, why are y'all crying? I, I've got, and he's saying, I'm jumping ahead, but he's saying, there's something else you need to be crying and weeping for. Not that you're barren. Or if you were. Daughters of Jerusalem. O oh, ye Jerusalem women, just as the inhabitants of Jerusalem are called daughters of Zion in Isaiah 3.16. Don't you love the way the Bible interprets the Bible? Weep not for me. That's what he says. Well, it's natural to weep for your loved ones, the ones you love, when they're going through hard times, especially at this time. But this was signifying that they need not be under any concern on his account. Don't be concerned for me. I have come to this earth for one purpose and one purpose only. To redeem man from his sins, to reconcile man to God. Period. Somebody said, well, what, why did Jesus come? It says it. Jesus came to save sinners. Because God made him to be sin for us and he knew no sin that you and I through faith in Christ can become the righteousness of God in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus never became a sinner like some false preachers will preach. God made him to be sin for us. Big difference. I've heard preachers preach that terrible theology about he had to become a sinner to save us from our sins. And some say that he had to go be tormented in hell to experience the torment that we feel. No, it was paid, your sin debt was paid in full at the cross, not in hell. That is a dogmatic statement and that's a hill I will die on, I promise you that. For he was very willing to die, he desired nothing more. This was the time he came into the world nor was he afraid to die. He knew what his purpose was. 
He knew what he was going to go through, but he wasn't afraid because before the beginning of time, he knew what his assignment was from God. That was the only way that you and I could have a right relationship with God our Father that created us. Death was no, was no king of terrors to him. He wasn't afraid. He was being tortured for our sins. God made him to be sin. That's how God hates sin. Do you hate sin as God hates sin? Obviously, he made him to be sin for us, and he not just crucified his son, he brutalized his son. He punished his son before his actual death. Now, the apostle Paul got beheaded. You know how long that takes? About two seconds. And then it's over with. But Jesus experienced torment before the cross. He went to the cross with the greatest courage that any, that is beyond my imagination. Besides his sufferings, he knew that it would be very great and painful. That's for a fact. That's a fact. Great and it was going to be painful, all right. God, it says, God was pleased to bruise his son. Not that he was happy about it. Is that that was the only perfect sacrifice in God's heart that could redeem sinful man to holy God. How could God still remain holy and forgive sinful men? Is to send his son to be an offering for sin. Yet they did, yet that they would soon be over, nor could he be long held in the power of death and sin, but he would be raised again. That's the validation that he is God, that he defeated sin, the powers of sin, the penalty of sin, the wages of sin. He defeated the grave. So you will never have to experience what Christ experienced. Become a Christian today. Don't say, I'm good enough to go to heaven. When perfection was displayed at the cross of Calvary. And he would go to his Father and be exalted at the, at the right hand of the throne of God and it, which he should be a matter of joy. That was the joy later on. The joy was coming, but it wasn't now. To which he might have added that hereby his father counsels and covet, purposes and promises would have their accomplishment. This was all foretold, foretold in the Old Testament. How did the apostles of the New Testament preach Christ? The Bible wasn't written. The New Testament wasn't written then. Somebody asked me that. Well, they preached from the Old Testament. Christ was all in the Old Testament. All the prophets preached about Christ. They didn't know what you and I know. Parts of Christ and His mission was hidden. But all of them preached the Messiah, the future Messiah. And when they brought bulls and goats to the altar, that was a sign of things to come. To which might be added that hereby his father's fulfilled justice satisfied completely and the perfections of God glorified. God's glory and mercy and forgiveness was completely displayed at the cross. That's where salvation came to all those who repent and believe in Christ. At the cross. Jesus did not have to go to hell to be tormented in hell to satisfy God's righteous anger towards sin. Propitiation. And the salvation of His chosen people effected the cross. There's nothing but the cross. I would start singing some songs about the cross, but I can't sing which as it was joy set before him is the ground of rejoicing to believers. It's a good thing that God loved us so much and wants a relationship for, with, with us for eternity that he did what he did and that was the only thing, as I said, God could remain righteous, holy, perfect, 
and true and still forgive sinful men of their sins is to do exactly what he did and he knew what he was going to do before the foundations of the world. That's eternity past. I don't, that's a mind blow. Eternity past. And as I was reading a little bit more, not that weeping on account of his sufferings of death was sinful, for he had offered prayers to God with cries and tears himself on his head, nor that it was altogether unreasonable, wasn't unreasonable to be crying, weeping, stupid or preposterous, but Christ's meaning is this, that when things are rightly considered, think of this for a minute, and as I was studying this, when I first read it, it, it didn't, I had to get into it because it wasn't popping out. So I'm studying it out. That's what I'm doing. That's what we should do. We're going to agree to disagree and things about theology, but this, this, this is not debatable theology. I don't ever debate debatable theology because it gets into arguments and it doesn't go anywhere. Always preach Christ and Him crucified. That's a hill that I will die on. And if you're a born-again Christian teacher, preacher, just a Christian just witnessing on the street, handing out tracts, spreading the good news of the gospel, study to show yourself approved. As I close for the first time, I always say that, don't I? Apostle Paul closed, what, three times in Philippians? But all that was not not unreasonable, stupid. But Christ's meaning is this, that when things were rightly considered in the big picture of things, there would be great reason that their grief would turn to joy. They didn't know that then. You and I know it. We're blessed that we have the Word of God. We can research and study. They didn't have the Word of God. They acted upon what they saw, what they heard from the apostles and the apostolic teachings. But there would be great reason for their grief. Sure. I grieve to people that are dying of coronavirus and cancer. I have friends that have died in accidents, and car accidents like that, young. I've had friends that have died of kidney failure. Name one, and I've had friends that have died suddenly. No, and one is too many. And, I, and you can't pray for the, for the people that have died. You know, people say RIP, quit it. A person that dies in their sins without Christ cannot rest in peace. You can't pray for the dead. Now, if, if, if you know they're a Christian, which you don't have to validate that this person is definitely a Christian. Well, really, do you know? Really, really, really? Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to see people in heaven. This is my own imagination. You're going to see people in heaven that you're going to go, What? How'd you get here? Well, remember the thief on the cross on the, on the other side? One didn't get saved, one got saved. He didn't do one thing or one good work. And, she said, and Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. The other said, oh, I'm a good person. Yeah, you, know, we need to, you need to get yourself down from here if you're, if you're who you say you are. And the other guy said, we deserve it. We deserve our punishment. We're criminals. This man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus looked at him. Could you imagine? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, you can say to him that he's definitely going to rest in peace. He'll be with Jesus and be like Jesus for eternity. Isn't that wonderful meditation when you're having a bad day? But people that die and you don't know they're a Christian, quit saying rest in peace. The Bible says, Jesus said people that will die in their own sins, there will be no rest day or night. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and they'll be salted with fire and brimstone. Does that sound like peace to you? But I know that God is merciful, and He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He says it in Scripture. 
It's God's will that all come to repentance and come to a knowledge of the truth. Why aren't people doing it more than they are? Well, the Bible answers that question too. People don't get saved because they know that they're going to have to think about sin as God thinks about sin. It says in the Bible, they don't come to God because they love their sin. Now, if you're loving sin, you're not a Christian. If you love sin, you cannot be a Christian. I hate it. God hated it more. Does it bother you when you sin as a Christian? If you do, your, your conscience is, is activated in doing well. If somebody says, oh, it doesn't bother me. There's a big problem. It's called a hypocritical problem. If you're a Christian and... and Sin doesn't bother you. You have a big problem. Your problem is you're not a Christian. If you're a born again, indwelt by Holy Spirit Christian, the Holy Spirit should be convicting you every time you sin. And if you're not being convicted, your conscience is seared. And you've taken the batteries out of the smoke detector so you wouldn't hear that aggravating noise so much when you're about to burn your house down. But on this account, and rather express it on another. But weep for yourselves and for your children. Weep for yourselves. Why? Not themselves personally, but their nation and their whole nation. He said, weep for yourself, the nation of Israel. And either for sin, their own, and others, their sins of professors and of the profane, particularly the sin of crucifying him, Which would be more serious to that people than to him and do them more hurt than him? I mean, what is, what is the ultimate sin? One sin is the ultimate sin. The Bible says if you sin once, you sin a thousand times. Oh, I only sin a hundred. My next door neighbor sins he sins like a hundred times a week. I only sin ten times a week, so I should get to heaven before him. No, you can't use that excuse either because your conscience won't let you. If you stole a dollar bill from me, it would be the same, wouldn't it, in your conscience if you stole a hundred dollar bill from me? It's called stealing. It's a sin. It's one of the Ten Commandments. In case you don't know what sin is, learn the Ten Commandments. You'll figure it out. That's a good place to start. There's other places in the Bible that talk about Christian conduct and what sin is regarding that. So they crucified him. Yep. That's what sinners do. Which would be more serious to that people than to him? To do more to hurt him since they had his blood on them. They had their, his, his blood on their hands, so to speak and their children, and their, their country, or rather, and chiefly on account of those distresses and calamities. I want to study this out more for sure, but I hope it helped you because if you're not a Christian, I implore you, I beg you, I beg you because today is, could be the last day you would spend on this earth. Do not die in your own sins after what God has done for you by sending his only sinless son to pay a ransom for your sins and mine. Do not stand before God in your own sins. You will hear these words, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. And don't be a cultural Christianity person. Everybody uses the word God. Everybody uses the word Christianity. But are you born again? Have you had a born again experience? That's who gets into heaven. Jesus said, unless a man or woman be born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. And God wants everyone. It's God's will that all come to repentance and come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants all men to spend eternity in heaven. So I close for the third time. 
or rather and chiefly on account of those in distress and calamities. We're having some calamities for sure right now. There's a lot going on on this earth. There's lots of different reasons why it's happening. That's for another time. They would come 